Welcome to the A to Z Educational Consultant Podcast. My name is Darswell Rogers, the host for this podcast. A to Z Educational Consultants is a group of transformational leaders that have been working with K-12 schools for the last 15 years in assisting teachers and school leaders in closing the achievement gap by informing, inspiring, engaging, and empowering them. A to Z operates with one goal in mind, no child left behind. Our topic for this session is systemic trauma in education. How are students, parents, and teachers, and administrators coping? We've got an illustrious panel for this discussion. I'd like to introduce them to you at this point. Uh, they are uh, Mr. Jim Dilday, who has spent 39 years as a public school educator and is a statewide leadership coach for administrative leaders. Mr. Tom Anderson, 25 years in public education with 20 of those years operating or managing special education programs. Dr. Carly Ann Dawson, 35 years in education from teacher to academia. She is a master trainer of trainers for adverse childhood experiences and for neurosequential mod and for neurosequential model model working with children in trauma. And then finally, uh, Ms. Dorothea Williams, she's a partner with A to Z Edu Consultants, A to Z Education Consultants. Dor Dorothea has been in education for the last 40 years. She's taught uh, K-12 special education and has been a school site administrator. And to all of you, uh, welcome to uh, today's conversation about systemic trauma in the public education system. I'd like to kick this off, I think, by asking Dr. Uh, Dr. Dawson, if you would be so kind as to really talk about the fundamental questions of trauma, and, uh, and I think you can, can, can start with the journal concepts of trauma, but then in particular within the context of what we've been dealing with during this pandemic, how that further exacerbates the trauma that uh, all of the parties that we've been talking about uh, are experiencing. Well, gladly. Thank you so much, Darswell. Um, you know, uh, trauma, if I can define it first by um, uh, a wonderful neuroscientist, uh, Dr. Bruce Perry, he says that trauma is defined as a psychological emotional response to an event or an experience that's deeply distressing or disturbing. And when you think about uh, that definition, in the context of school and, and education and what's going on, Darswell, we've never been at this place before. We've never experienced what, we've ex what we're experiencing currently. And we really don't know how to do it. Um, we know that schools have changed greatly. The, uh, the way education is being delivered is nothing we've ever experienced. Uh, we've got children who you know, aren't in schools with their teachers, like they, you know, across the nation. You've got some schools, some children that are there. You've got parents teaching their children. Uh, we've always had homeschooling, but not to this degree. You've got administrators worried about, you know, their staff, uh, staff worrying about their students. So, this pandemic has caused us to look at and deliver education in a way that it has not been. And it's just causing a lot of, of unsettled stress, overwhelming stress, uh, is causing uh, uh, individuals to be depressed be, um, because there is no social contact. You know, schools are all about kids interacting socially. And the social distancing, which is, and I really prefer to call it physical distancing because as people, you know, we cannot live without touch. And when we are, when people say the social distance, I think people took that to heart and meant that they, you know, weren't going to contact anybody. But we need that contact. We need human touch, human kindness. We need that. And so with all of that in, in, in mind, it is causing us to look at education totally different. 
Um, and, and I'd like to add uh, into uh, that. Please, 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 Jim, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, Dr. Dawson is so right when she says we have never universally been through something like this. We've had trauma in our individual lives and we've had trauma as a nation before, but who would have expected that now we are in eighth, the eighth month right. of really just hunkering down and trying to be safe so that we can save one another? and be safe for ourselves and safe for our neighbors and our families. And sure, we've had home teaching before, but those who home teach have always wanted, had selected to home teach. Now we have a whole bunch of mothers and fathers and grandparents and just great neighbors who are willing to take up that charge and step in. But the stress, the trauma that results from that and especially not being able to communicate because as humans that's what we live for we live to communicate and understand one another and it's it's just been so tough on everyone and so then we we see the trauma in ways that we never expected whether we personally think we're experiencing it our bodies tell us we're experiencing it yeah so uh, Dorothea Williams, let me let me turn to you. Um, um, what is it that you have seen across your clients uh, during the course of the pandemic that perhaps might be different or unique from the, either the sort of questions, the sort of challenges, uh, or experience that you've seen as you've been out uh, talking with educators uh, across uh, your 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 customer base? Um, one of the things that I've noticed in talking to teachers, I'm going to start with teachers and then go to administrators. The level of stress in teachers is something that I've never seen before because they know how to deliver instruction, but now they are asked to teach in a way that they've never been trained to teach that way. Mm -hmm. So many of them are spending an inordinate number of hours on websites and webinars trying to learn how do I keep my students engaged in a way that is productive and that I know that they're learning? Um, if you go to Simple K-12, for example, they have a webinar series for professional development for educators. They oftentimes have as many as 1, 1,500 people on, teachers who are on trying to learn how to do something in a different manner. They know the content, but they don't know how to deliver it to students in a way that is engaging. Then when you start talking to administrators, they're talking, they're concerned in a multitude of ways. One, are my kids okay and are they safe? Teachers have that same concern. Some teachers are actually reading bedtime stories to the little ones. They are taking food over to homes because they're not sure if there's food scarcity in that particular home. The administrators are doing site visits, trying to figure out how can they support their teachers. But in addition to that, it's not only that they have to ensure that their students are safe and try to support them, they're now having to support their staffs in a different way because they're seeing depression among their colleagues. Their teachers are accustomed to being at work and having social interaction. And some teachers, some of their staff members may not live with anybody. And so they, when they don't hear from them on a regular basis, they're having, their level of anxiety is raising also because they wanna make sure that everyone is safe as well. So I think this environment has caused us all to have to kind of pause and realize that we're in a new era of education. And so, teaching virtually, not the same as teaching face-to-face. Absolutely. So, and, and Tom Anderson, let me ask you, uh, you've got a special focus on special education. Is, are there some additional unique characteristics or challenges that you're seeing in the special education space compared to the general population in public schools? For sure, definitely. Um, I think Dr. Dawson and Jim and Dorothea painted a really good picture of the trauma involved with our students and families and staff. Um, but when we f talk about students with special needs, whether they're in special education or they're just at risk um, or they're unique students with some unique needs, many of those needs have not been served through distance learning the same way uh, that they have 
they were served when kids were coming to school every day. And it's been a struggle for most school districts and schools to find a way to mobilize the same kind of service level and the same kind of service delivery as kids weren't coming to school anymore, they're at home. And it would be one thing to say, well, we'll just go, home. We'll just go to the home and we'll provide speech services. We'll provide occupational therapy. But for a long period of time, people weren't allowed in other people's homes. Nobody wanted anybody else in their homes. And so it is not simply a different model, but the restrictions around what we could do to try to address the changes were such that it severely impeded the ability for school districts to provide the same level and type of service that students with special needs would typically get if they were at school. And although most of the discussion so far has been around distance learning, remote learning, and what we've had to deal with, we're even facing a new challenge because everybody's thinking about coming back. Everybody's got a different model, a um, lot of similarities, but there's a new trauma around potentially coming back and what that means for staff and for students. So I believe that the next few months and, and who knows how long, it could be much longer than that, but they're gonna be crucial because one of the things that this um, change in paradigm has allowed us is a chance to take a step back and look at our educational systems and focus on some of those things that we knew were wrong with them and determine whether or not this is an opportunity to fix them, to make sure there's a little bit more equity, to make sure that we have some systems that are a little bit more equitable for students. Um, but I don't know that there's any real solid answers out there yet about how we come back and do it better. In fact, most of our questions are just about coming back and being safe. So the trauma of this paradigm shift um, is going to be long lasting and it's gonna be a pivotal piece of how we regroup and re-image education um, in, in California and America and across the globe. I'm glad you brought that up, Tom, because this week I was in several meetings with um, IEP meetings and meetings with teachers and principals together. And I can tell you, I heard the most curious thing, but true thing to a person, parents asking, am I doing the right thing? Teachers wondering and voicing, am I doing the right thing? Principals questioning, I did this, but I'm not sure it was just the right thing. I heard from everyone except a couple of the students just kind of shrugged because they didn't know because they're feeling it deep inside themselves. So just interesting that they all lined up with that same question. So and is that, oh, go ahead, Carly. And the, and the sad thing to think about, uh, uh, to your point, uh, Tom, is that you've got, um, I'm sorry, Jim, you've got, in, uh, you've got students in trauma and teachers in trauma who really can't learn during this time. They, they're, they're, there's so much stuff going on that they really can't think clearly about new learning. And, and we've, you know, teachers can't present the way they, they, they want to because not only is it online, but this is new learning, new things that they're trying to do. And is it, it because of the trauma they're experiencing, you know, their mind is all over the place and really can't get to where that clear thinking is in order to teach the way they normally would be able to teach. And the students on the other end of it, uh, there's, there's some of them who are going through things as class is going on and they just can't process information. Yeah. The way they normally do. Austin, you know better than any of us here on this panel that the neuroscience around how brains react to trauma and new learning and, and accessing the areas that they need to to acquire new knowledge and new routine exactly exactly and things from short term to long term it's just it's nowhere near the same and that's just talking about the students you mentioned our teachers too the ability to think at a higher level when you're experiencing this kind of upheaval and change doesn't allow our teachers to teach the way that they want to. And even when we come back, 
there will be a period of time, and I have no idea how long this will last, and it will be individualized to the staff members and the students involved, but there will be, will be a period of time where they still don't learn the way they did before or as quickly as they did before. Mm -hmm. And so the long-term effects of this are unknown. Um, what we do know is we're going to have to accept and understand them and learn as we go what new things or different things or things we will need to do better. So hey, let me ask you a question if I can. Uh, is, is, have any of you all seen within the school systems today uh, administrators recognizing this trauma and working to implement any sort of strategies that might support either what they're going through, this, the teachers, the parents, is, is, and, and if so, what have you seen um, Absolutely. That, that they're doing? Absolutely, Darswell. Um, what, what impresses me is when leaders within the educational system and within the community, and I'm talking about teachers and leaders at their level of the organization, the superintendent, the principal, the, um, the, all the support staff. When I see that they look at a child and say to themselves, I'm gonna go beyond. We need better communication. We need better outreach to the families. I'm gonna, as was said, go out to the homes, um, socially distance, but really encourage them to maintain their hope because we know we're going to get through this. And then to organize um, Zoom projects and other ways to communicate with groups of people so that it goes beyond the family communicating and gets the community communicating. Those are the kind of things I think have been very beneficial. And you know what I found is that teachers and, and the administrators do something innately they know, they feel in their gut, this is the right thing to do. But then when they, they don't necessarily know that, you know, what the names or the train is behind it all. They can talk about it, but can't name it. And when you put a name to what's happening, it validates not only what they believe was happening, but now it's like it brings it to another level of awareness that now we all know this is what it's called and we can do something about it. Absolutely. And I think there, I've talked to a young um, middle school principal recently, and she has decided that those students who are most at risk in her school, she has a weekly chat session with them and they can earn badges. And she has put a whole badge program together so that at integral part times during the year, every month, they come to the school site and they can come in a socially dis or physically distanced manner and pick up whatever they have earned during that time period. Just keeping the kids as connected as they can. She gives them opportunities to talk about the topics that they wanna talk about. They are online, they're in a Zoom for about 45 minutes to an hour. Just having a social conversation because a lot of our kids are going to need to have those opportunities to be re-socialized when they come back into the school setting. Also, I think we have to look at the fact that we have to accept the fact that many of our students are gonna be behind when they do return to school. And we're gonna to have to look at how are we going to intervene and give them the supports that they need academically while we're supporting our whole staff. I think this is a new experience for every administrator, every superintendent, this is not what any of us have ever done. We're in a new era of education altogether. I think when we come out of it, we're gonna have a lot of things that we've learned and that will continue and will be very beneficial for our students. I think Dr. Anderson's conversation around um, the special education students, I think the way we service those students, we're going to look at, have to look at a multi, even though they had a multidisciplinary approach, we're going to have to look at how do we provide those services in a way that are meaningful for all of those students so that they don't ever feel like they are not part of the school community. Well, let, let me offer this up. I, I think that uh, what I'm hearing uh, suggests that there is a lot of good things taking place, but it doesn't sound like it is systemic. 
It sounds like it is ad hoc. It sounds like there's a little bit here. Uh, somebody who's got a level of empathy is offering a little bit over here, uh, but there, but that it's at best disjointed, and probably some um, administrators, teachers, students are getting nothing, and others are are getting just the right amount, and then others are probably like, you know, I'm I'm good, uh, you know, and, and arguably. The, the focus should be, could be on someone else, but there's not a, there's no broad based program or strategy on how to do this. And so uh, what I'd like to propose is that, um, I think we've done a, a wonderful job of teeing this thing up. What I'd like to propose is that when we come back in our next session, that we go straight at this question of what are the systemic opportunities whereby we go from administrator to child straight through to the parent uh, and the teacher and say, okay, we've got a group of, of, uh, of people here that are all experiencing very similar things, but, but they all have different ways that they're, that they're coping with it. And, and, and then to uh, uh, hopefully propose some things that can be done in a, in a again, because we've got systemic trauma and it's and we it seem, I seem generally taking an ad hoc approach, and so uh, for those of you who are listening, I hope that you stay with us. We're going to uh, continue with another podcast, um, but I want to uh, uh, express my appreciation to Dr. Car Carly and Dawson, uh, Jim Dilday, Tom Anderson, and Dolores Williams for having participated in this session. We look forward to you coming back and listening to the next A to Z educational podcast. So long for Thank now. You, Thank you. Thank you.